go. Okay, hello everyone. This is this is exciting. Um, welcome. Um, thank you for joining Poetry Daily and the Chu Center for the first of four of our co-sponsored virtual events. Um, what translation sparks? Um, before I begin, if you could please, you probably already like know this because you're so used to Zoom, but if you could mute yourself, that would be great. It's great to see you all. So many people. Um, my name is Sally Keith. Uh, I'm currently the editorial director for Poetry Daily. I alternate with my colleague, uh, Peter Streckfuss. I'm also a poet and professor uh, of poetry at George Mason University. Um, I'm gonna say a few words about our project, briefly introduce the poets who will then each read their translation and offer for you a bit of context. We'll then get into the conversation after which I will reserve some space for a Q and A. So if you have a question, if you can send it to me in the chat, I will try hard to keep track of it and answer the, you know, the, the panelists can answer the questions at the end. Um, I wanna say how grateful and happy we are to be co-hosting with the Chu Center. Um, run by Matt Davis, who is here with us tonight. The Chu Center for International Writers celebrates the art of creative writing as a means of international dialogue, education, and understanding. At its core, the Chu Center facilitates the exchange of international creative writers and writing in order to help foster the tolerance and empathy a more connected world requires. Poetry Daily now houses at George Mason University's MFA program and run largely by a team of uh, really wonderful graduate assistants and volunteers, is committed to publishing one new poem a day. Um, we reserve Mondays for an essay series, What Sparks Poetry, or some variation thereof, in which writers share their inspiration. In this new series, which will run for the next 13 weeks, prominent poet translators have been asked to share a seminal experience in translation. We are especially curious about how the work of translating poetry feels essential to the art and practice of writing poetry. And it's in this direction that I'll attempt to steer our conversation. Um, so before beginning, I'm gonna offer abbreviated biographies of these renowned poets and translators. Um, I hope that you will refer to uh, poems.com, Poetry Daily for the original essays, um, full bios and poems. So we'll start, uh, Kazim Ali's recent books are a collection of poetry entitled The Voice of Sheila Chandra and a memoir of his Canadian childhood, Northern Light. He is an accomplished translator of Marguerite Dara, Sorab Safiri, Ananda Devi, Mahmoud Chakrali, and others. He currently is a professor of literature at the University of California, San Diego. Dan Beachyquick's new books include Arrows from Tupelo <laughs> Press and Stone Garland from Milkweed, a collection of translations from the ancient Greek. He teaches at Colorado State University where he's a university distinguished teaching scholar. For a scander, we're trying to get here, there he is. Yay, <laughs> he's arrived. <laughs> Forrest Gander's books, um, often concerned with ecology, uh, recently include Be With, winner of a 2019 Pulitzer Prize, the novel The Trace, and Core Samples from the World. He's translated really a lot, including Alice Iris' Red Horse, poems by Goso Yoshimashu, and Then Come Back, the Lost Neruda poems. He lives in Northern California. Jennifer Grote's most recent poetry collection is Window Left Open, uh, a translator from the French and Polish, her new translation, Everything I Don't Know, the selected poems of Jerzy Fikowski, co-translated with Piotr Sommer, and forthcoming from the world, um, from world poetry, sorry. Uh, she's the director of the Bread Loaf Writers Conferences, in, including the Conference on Translation, and teaches at the University of Rochester. So uh, without further ado, we're going to start, we're going to go alphabetically and, you know, as I mentioned, each translator is going to read their poem and, and give you a little bit of context. So we'll start with Kazim. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's really wonderful to be here with you um, celebrating translation and with these three other amazing translators uh, whose 
poetry and whose translations have meant so much to me. Um, the poem that I translated is a long poem by a um, poet named Ananda Devi. She's an Indo-Mauritian poet. Uh, Mauritius is an island in the Indian Ocean, not too far from Madagascar. And it's comprised of a um, high population of French, English, South Asian population that were brought as indentured labor and African population. So it's a very uh, mixed cosmopolitan society with multiple languages. Um, it has a long, a long history, of course, of French and British uh, colonialism. And so um, many of the writers there write in English, they write in French. Um, most people actually speak a third language, Mauritian Creole. And then the baby happens to write in French. And this poem is, uh, it's a long poem of 30 parts. And the section that I translated was, um, that, that I included on Poetry Daily is the ending of the poem. And the book, the poem is called, in English, when the night agrees to speak to me. And in these 30 small parts, it is the, you know, a story of a woman's life, basically, um, practically. So here's the ending of the sequence. You don't know how to age. Your wounds have opened you to all the winds. You think you know yourself, but all you have is emptiness. Writing will have only been the briefest of mysteries. There is nothing left. Where there was once a body, I don't see you anymore, scattered there. Shame, I never really knew how to die. Advice, night left nothing but scorn for the bed sheets and on the floor an unrolled swath of green sorry indifferent to the lot of a woman erased by her bruises. And then the final section, this sticky thing issuing from my body, announcing every month its fatal purity. I forgot what it was to live until there were no more grand entrances of this resinous muck. That's an Ananda Devi. Thank you. Dan? Yeah, that was a lovely Cosm, thank you. And, and just as you said, I feel very lucky to be reading among friends and, and poets who I admire deeply and who helped shape me. Um, so I, I, the poet that I, I, I'll read from is, uh, Alkman, who's the most ancient of the six that I translated in the seventh century um, BC, and has a lovely story. He's, um, uh, you know, one of these lives of the poets um, that to read about um, makes you feel deeply endeared to them. And he was born a, a household slave to a, a, a wealthy man. Um, who freed him from his servitude for his ability to sing beautifully. Um, songs that, that according to um, the mythical accounts of Alkman's life, he learned from listening to uh, the partridges and, and the doves. Um, he, he made his way from Sardis um, to uh, Sparta. Um, and Sparta, which was a kind of notoriously selective and, and exclusive, um, city state actually let him in and and he ended up there um, leading the choirs of young girls and young boys and, and teaching them songs it it is said that if he hadn't been freed he would have ended up a, a man um, a, a eunuch um, who would uh, work in the holy rites of the of the religious um, societies in Sardis. Um, and instead he became renowned as one of the first writers of, of erotic and, and love poems, um, a, a, a strange um, loving thing. And, and when he died, Sparta made him a citizen, which is um, an incredibly high honor. And um, the poem has something of, of this 
loving ritual, I think, that, that so marks Alkman's work. They are sleeping mountain heads, headlands, and the gullies too. The fallen leaves and tribe of slow footed creatures, the dark earth grows. Beasts of prey, mountain bred and brood of wild bees and the brute monsters deep in the deep purple seas. And that, flo and that flock of omen giving birds long winged, they are sleeping too. Thank you, Dan. Um, Forrest? Ah, there you go. Okay, hi, Forrest. Yay, good, hi. <laughs> I unmuted myself. Um, I'm uh, translating um, Coral Bracho. I, I did a book of hers before uh, called, of selected poems called Firefly uh, Under the Tongue. And um, I thought I would do, that was maybe 10 years ago, and I thought I would do another selected poems. But when I started reading her most recent book, which concerns her mother's Alzheimer's, um, and is a kind of book length um, series of poems, I wanted to stick with it. I'd lost my own mother, um, my, my sister and I, uh, my sister who's watching, hey Karen, um, lost our mother to Alzheimer's. And this book, because the poems build on each other, just gets more and more powerful. Um, Coral Bracho is a really signal, um, one of the most important contemporary Mexican poets, and her work has been translated into a lot of languages. She's well known in Europe and all through Latin America. So um, the, um, I'll read two little poems. I, I guess we're, we're not reading in the original language, right? Yeah, okay. Alzheimer's, follow up, so doctor's office. Who is the president of this country? Well, it depends. For some, it's one person. For others, it's someone else. What is this called? I don't know, doctor, because I don't use that. Only you do. How many children do you have? Mm, quite a few. What did you used to do? Now you're going to ask me to draw a clock. Did you like to dance? Yes, of course, of course I danced. And did you ever travel? Yes, naturally. Where to? Well, to the same place everyone went. And another one called Observations. She can't ask any longer to be loved but who can ask to be loved? Nor that someone sit beside her to wait with her. Life slips away with all the gestures, with all the memories, with all at its core strength, its beauty, which have foundered with her. Years ago, she stopped speaking. How does she think? How does she link the diffuse wobbly trajectories that lead her here? And you? She asked me once, how do you come to know? Thank you so much, Forrest. Um, Jen. Such powerful, those are such powerful poems, Forrest. Um, okay, uh, the, the way that I came upon um, Jerzy Fitsowski, the poet that um, I'll be talking about tonight was through another poet, Piotr Sommer, um, a well-known Polish poet and translator. He approached me um, with the idea of our co-translating a volume of Fitsowski's poetry when he came to Rochester and we, he was a visiting um, professor. Um, and I think we thought that, you know, in a semester we could pull together a selected poems or a volume, and instead, it, it this has been a um, a ten year process of pulling together this this volume of selected poems. Partly because we got more ambitious, partly because we realized just how 
um, challenging um, the process was, but also rewarding, I would say. And um, since I so rarely get the chance to do this, I'm gonna, before I read the poem, I'm gonna do a quick show and tell of some of his books. <laughs> Uh, because the, these are really special um, volumes that I don't get the chance to share with people very often. Um, Jerzy Fitzowski was born in 1924. He died um, in 2006. He was based in Warsaw in Poland. Um, his first uh, book of poems is this right here, um, a Wowiani um, Jomierze lead soldiers was published in 1948 and this was an official publication but you can see the quality of of paper um, at the end of the war um, about midway through his career this is an example of a samizdat um, version of his poetry you can see what what this looks like on on very um acidic poor quality paper um, hand typed um, and arranged illegally printed. This is a book called Grips. It has some beautiful poems. We, we translated several poems from this collection. Um, uh, Grips is a word that I decided was untranslatable in English. In Polish it means um, a, a, like a smuggled letter or smuggled note of, uh, passed in prison. Um, and um, the last one I'll show you is, is Pantarea. This is Fitowski's final book that he published um, in 2006. Um, and the title poem, Pantarea, is the poem that I, that I submitted to Poetry Daily that I decided I would talk about. Um, Pantarea is a, a word that Fitowski invented. He, it, in Polish, it acts as a noun, but um, he adapted it from the, from the Greek, from Heraclitus, um, panta rei, which you may be familiar with. Um, in English, we generally translate it as everything um, flows, everything changes, everything passes. Um, Heraclitus, you'll remember uh, fifth century BC, the great West, Western, philosopher of impermanence. Um, and I, I guess the one thing I'll say, I mentioned this in the essay, but if people haven't had the chance to familiarize themselves, uh, Fitsovsky makes Pantarea into a noun um, to actually make it a proper name, which he has assigned to um, either a butterfly or a moth. It's not really clear from the poem. And I did track down Linnaeus, who he mentions in the poem, and his the, the species that he categorized in the in Guam. And um, the he did he he categorized many Lepidoptera, um, including moths and butterflies. So it's unclear if this is addressed to a moth or a butterfly. Um, the poem's called Pantarea. Long ago in the Guam archipelago, I met the four-winged Pantarea with large slanted eyes, one on each wing not noted in Linnaeus. Today she is flying to me, already halfway here. She hobbles in the airs, my three-winged one, asymmetrical, the Yupi Typhoon tore from her the fourth wing. I keep it in this drawer, the left hazel one now asleep. Careful, don't touch because it's losing sight. And there, Yupi Junior lurks for one more sidelong glance, or maybe even three, slant eyed. And you are flying after your ruin or to your ruin, who knows, Pantarea? You are halfway now, so many years and years and years, only in flight and flight and flight. Oh, how long it is, this halfway. Thank you, Jen, that's so beautiful. Um, uh, 
Okay, I'm just going to start, I sort of, you know, reading these wonderful essays, which again, I want to emphasize you can find on, um, on Poetry Daily, that's, that's where they are. Every Monday we're publishing one. So starting just from where we just were in Jen's essay about code translating Fakowski, which I'm saying wrong, um, she gets at how imagination can live in technical choices like diction and rhyme, but also in poetic logic. Um, and she lands on this interesting and essential question. What is it we're actually influenced by when we read or translate from another language? Um, a bit further down the paragraph, uh, Jen brings up the possibility of escaping influence as much as seeking it. Um, so there's more than one question here, but I hope you all would comment as best you can. Um, what is it about that turn to another language or another voice that has felt compulsive or necessary to you? Um, and, and I'm just gonna let you jump in and see how that goes. Well, we all live in a country that um, <laughs> hasn't taken much interest in the rest of the world, famously so. Um, and so part of the compulsion is, um, is to, um, to increase an awareness of what's going on in the rest of the world. And also, although viruses aren't... <clears throat> really a good thing to be talking about now, to introduce um, elements of other languages as a kind of virus into English that refreshes English, an inoculation maybe, an inoculation against um, English as just uh, a, a, a language of displacing power. Um, for me, I think I came to translating Ananda Devi, it was first I came to it as a reader. It was, um, she was not a poet I'd ever heard of before or knew anything about. Although I think uh, as a South Asian person, I was interested in uh, South Asian Francophone literature by people of South Asian descent. And um, I was reading the book and this, these were not poems that I would have ever written myself. They weren't poems I was comfortable with as a writer. They were intriguing as a reader. But when I began translating them, of course, meaning writing those poems again in English, it really, I think it really like Forrest, as you said, it, 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 the practice of passing those poems through my own body really changed me as a writer, I feel. I, I, I mean, that sounds dramatic, but um, it really, really made a difference to me. I mean, I can see the line, and I've translated other writer, writers. I've translated Marguerite Duras. I translated um, So Rob Perry, the Iranian writer, as, um, as Sally mentioned in the introduction. But with Davy, it was, it, was, it, was, it was really impactful because I think the work was so different from mine. And I became that kind of poet in order to write those poems in English, translating across gender, translating across age. You know, right? You know, the baby is 16 or some years older than me at any rate, but at a very different point in her life at the end of this long marriage. Um, the speaker of these poems is very embittered. Um, you know, so I was, I was becoming a whole other person, I was becoming a whole other human when I translated them and I couldn't go back. I mean, you can't just take the clothes off when you're done. <laughs> you know, I'm not sure, I think I'll stop there. I have more to say. My cat is coming into my lap, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, I, I'm thinking about the Tower of Babel, which is the great, um, you know, Old Testament story that uh, that I think you know is, is such a it's like a, a really important fable I think for literary translation the the idea that there was there was some notion of humanity that became splintered when we were shattered into these different languages and somehow whatever it is to be a human being um, is not um, oops I just had a light malfunction. <laughs> um, 
whatever it is to be a human being is not it, it's 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 language it's in the lanes of, of individual languages but there's this platonic ideal or of the superhuman version the, this original um way of being a human that embodies what it all the things that every language gives us and i think about that with poetry i mean the reason i'm bringing up is with poetry that um, any of us, anyone who speaks more than one language or reads poetry in other traditions, you get the sense that, um, you know, the, the whole idea of a national poetry, when you think about it, it's kind of crazy because um, poetry is the most human genre that, that transcends languages. And so I think when we think about um, translation, we're trying to get access to all of the powers of poetry and to not limit ourselves to just what our fashions are or um, our, what's happening in the interior of a country. And I really love what Forrest was saying about um, how poets over time go uh, you know, we're drawing, we're, we are trying to get the virus of other traditions to infect our language, to renovate it, to keep it clean, um, to widen the aperture of what the medium can do. Um, you know, translation is what we had long before the writing workshop. It's how poets um, mastered their medium um, and explored what a poem could do. Thank you. Lecture over. <laughs> it's it's odd to hear Jen talk about the the Tower of Babel. Is it's been much on my mind, and, and in a class I'm teaching, a co-teaching actually, um, in pottery and poetry, where for the last five weeks students have been they, they've made themselves into the workers in a brick factory, and we've been building these these bricks and printing words on them, and and finding very simple ways to get towards a particular material and, and the whole class was going to culminate in building a freestanding catenary arch large enough that every student could walk through it and we spent three hours building it and they have to choose word to word and match a kind of like a metaphor as, as a form of mortar and, and we get to five minutes before the class is there and the, and the arch is built and there's these accidents that are so lovely. You know, they, they print it on all sides of the brick. So one of the thin edges of the arch just says A about five feet up and poem about four inches off the ground. And the other side says, oh, hope. And then of course the whole thing tumbled in on itself. Um, a, a little tower of, of Babel, which is one of the stories that we taught. Um, and, and, you know, the, the thing that, there's this line from Alan Grossman that I think is undergirding much of my thinking about poetry and my turn towards translation. And he simply says, I have a mouth to sing another song. And there's something I, I feel potentially at the very foundation of lyric practice that is hinting at, at an anonymity inside what it is to speak that's more profound than the identity of the mouth that says it and finding ways as, as I hear Jen talking about or the transformation Cosm is talking about or the need for contagion that forest is. Um, that, that we find ourselves in translation returning to a realm of the common that isn't available in, 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 in other kinds of ways. And, and that sense of, of a shared territory, I, I think is a really needed thing. Thank you, those are such beautiful answers. I, I kind of don't wanna like co-opt the conversation too much. I mean, I, I, I really love that you know, I have a mouth to sing another song and, and the idea of like courting, even though it's not courting anonymity in some way. And, and also thinking back, just I was just struck by Jen, Jen saying like, it could be a way to escape an influence also as a, as a poet. So I have more questions, but does anyone wanna add anything else right now or shall I go on to the next question? Just something that Jen said that also seemed to, um, connect to what Kazim said. Jen talked about access to uh, all the powers of poetry. And, um, and Kazim talked about being changed by the translation. 
and that it's been my experience also that um, translation adds to the repertoire of what a poet can do. That's not principally why you go about it. It's not a, with a selfish interest, but there's this uh, residual gift that it, um, uh, as Jen said, opens your apertures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want, can I pipe in on that? It also um, makes English strange to you again. And, and that might not just be translating, it might also be teaching translation. Um, but I find myself now when I'm thinking about English, like the w little weirdnesses that I don't, that I, you wouldn't ordinarily think about, but then as a translator, you're always wrestling with. Mm -hmm. Like for example, one of the ones I use as an example with my own students is the English um, verb put and how whatever you put with it, it changes it completely. Like to put out or to be put out with somebody or to put someone up means to house them, but to put someone down means to insult them. Do you see what I mean? Like the meaning just ranges so radically, but the word is the same word. So I, I mean, I don't know, I'm just so interested that like, I think it's after I started translating and talking about translation of people that I started to realize what a strange, bizarre language English really is. And when you think you know it so well and you just talk it every day, you, 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 miss, all, you miss that because the, you know, the familiarity takes that away from you, I think. Mm -hmm. I think it's one of the reasons why students of mine that who are perfectly bilingual have a really hard time translating. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I was thinking, you know, my next question was sort, sort of along those lines, but I was thinking about in Dan's essay, he, he talks about like sort of coming upon in Greek the, the middle voice, which he figured out by like, like I, mean, I could let him speak for himself, but by, but by how, how Greek verbs work differently than, than English verbs do. But I, and, and Cosm, I thought you also in your essay were talking about kind of how, um, you know, you get at a translation as a kind of discovery that is equally true of all poetic utterance in that it approaches a kind of impossibility of, of translating experience, which we all as writers, I think, in with pleasure, you know, struggle against. But I guess I was curious about, and Cosm just sort of answered this, like what, if you have um, kind of examples or uh, of sort of aspects of the process of translating, like the actual work of it that have effect, affected your writing in English or your, your, your your original poetry. And so I think you saying like it makes English strange is, is certainly one great example. I mean, yeah, hundred percent yes. And I also think studying translation makes someone a stronger poet because when you're sitting in a poetry workshop and you're trying to talk about a poem, I think people feel like, oh, I don't know, you feel delicate in a certain way or you might only want to talk about one aspect of it. But when you throw a translation down in a translation workshop, you bring in a translation that you've done. And then I say to the students, okay, let's talk about it. I mean, we just jump right in. Oh, well, the third line, I'm not sure how that worked with the rhythm over here. Oh, I'm not really sure what this means. Like people really, really, you know, for loads of reasons, right? Like the ego of the writer or whatever distance it allows to, to look at the text, but it's so, it's such a different, the translation workshop is such a different room and has such a different energy than a poetry workshop or a creative writing workshop. So I feel like I would probably suggest that translation should be a, like a requirement in a creative writing degree. Let's, I would, just, yeah, I just, would, let's just make that a rule, okay? I'm, I'm deciding. I would chime in to agree with that. I mean, I, I'm kind of surprised. As I was saying a minute ago, it's it's much older than creative writing, which is an American invention for best or for better or worse. Probably invented at bread loaf even better for, for better or worse. Um, <laughs> but a very recent, recent invention. And um, yeah, I know I, I have ambivalence about it. Um, but I lost my train of thought. What were you saying? Um, ugh, I just lost my train of thought. That it should be required. Oh, that it should be required. Well, yeah, because it's one of the ways that you assume your craft. Um, it's also one of the ways you, as, as 
someone was saying earlier, it's one of the ways you, un, I think Kaza was saying, where you understand the medium of the English language. You, I mean, you don't really understand what um, English can do until you find out what it can't do or what it, you know, and, you know, every language I think has its own superpowers, um, the things that it's, it's actually very gifted in. And you discover um, that poets that you choose to translate generally um, have learned how to exploit those superpowers. And that's exactly what makes them so untranslatable. When you bring that back to your own writing as a poet, then it also inspires you. What am I doing? Am I maximizing the powers of the, of the English language in my poems? Um, so I think, I mean, I think that's a, that's, uh, that's a lifelong project to, to practice. Anyway, I'm just agreeing with Cosm. I do, I think, have this sneaking suspicion that being inside poetry for however many years one might be actively trying to write simply a good poem, that hidden in that work is the requirement to begin translation, like, like something in a certain approach to what it is to write poetry has hidden within it this particular kind of demand. Um, and, and how you attune yourself to that is, is a kind of curious thing for all of us, I, I suspect. Um, how it's affected my own writing and that question is such a curious kind of thing. I, I mean, one of the real differences between where I spend my translating life and where my friends here do is I'm reading very ancient things and very few of them are, are um, whole in any kind of way. They're, they're kind of radically fragmented. And one of the most moving aspects of this work um, is just noting how feeling and thought and the feeling that is thinking and the thinking that is feeling can leave traces across very vast distances, not just between millennia ago to now, but between the fragments of lines and poems themselves. And it's given me this license, which I don't think I allowed myself wholly before to allow such distances into my own work and, and to, to trust that, that a fragment has a way of being more whole than, than an entire poem can be and, and, and to begin to, to let a little bit of ruin in, I think, to, to my poems. That just brings up, um, there are hardly any discussions of translation that don't bring Pound up and Pound's in bad favor these days. But I think he's the first to translate you know, fragments of Sappho as a whole poem when in that, you know, papyrus um, spring too long Gangula, where Gangula is a woman's name. And it works as he presents it as a whole poem, mm. which is complicated also because it's not a whole poem. And what if, what if we knew the rest of Sappho? Yeah, that, well, that pound is always complicated, isn't he? But, but you're, I, I loved Dan's um, writing prompt that was attached to the, the essay that, that is also about that, you know, writing the parts that are missing and then erasing the parts that are there that um, it's still a very pregnant place to think. Um, and I, the, the other thing I was, I think I wanted to, I was, that I would lost my train of thought on was, um, it's related to it, which is how, when you think of these ancient Greek texts and also broken text, the, the question of what is a poem or, and what can poems do, that's always so um, worth asking and exploring. And, you know, the rules that we have in create, you know, show, don't tell, that is not a rule for Sappho. I mean, that that is not a rule for Zbigniew of Herbert. Um, it, 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 it's so tonic to, um, refresh one's memory and senses of, of what our limits are, you know, what our, our conversation is. And again, I'm, I'm all, I'm so widening the aperture, sort of my, um, my motto with translation, because I think that's the great gift that translation gives us. 
and I do think that when we um, when we now as you know in contemporary going back to ancient and translating ancient work to think about the ways the past was created and the ways that we ourselves can um, in interrogate that. So I think about Maria Devana Headley's new translation of Beowulf that came out. And one of the things about it is like, she makes Grendel's mother in the poem into, not into a demoness or a monster, but into like a warrior woman, a hu you know, human warrior woman. And so people were like, well, you're changing things. And she said, no, I'm actually not changing things. I'm actually translating what's in the book. She's not described as monstrous in, in that way, like as a lizard creature or a dragon or something like that. She is only described in terms of her strength and her whatever, her prowess and her ability. So I think, or, or Emily Wilson, when she did the Odyssey and she talked about the scene with the hanging of the maids in the house and the word that was used. And she talked about all the different you know, uh, you know, Fitzgerald and Lattimore and Lombardo and everybody and the words that the word they used and then the actual Greek word, which just means serving girl, you know? So she said, those, tr those translators created meaning. I'm not creating like what people say is like, okay, well, this is a feminist interpretation. And she's saying, actually, I'm, no, I'm stripping away all of what the interventions had been. Um, and of course, Sappho is like the, the perfect example of how the poet is has been created by the tradition of translation that has happened, the industry of translation really around around the creation of Sappho as a figure. You know, she's this sort of outline in which you can put in what any number of Sapphos that exist. Um, so something that all three of my colleagues here, um, uh, Jan and Dan and and uh, Kazim, just said. Um, Jen said at first, uh, talking about translation, um, the act of translating as a place to think. And Dan talking about that also really, that it's that the feeling that thinking is happens in this end. And then Kazim talking about thinking about the past through translation, that it is, um, I mean, I think that's the best that art can do is to be a place for us to think and to feel. One thing I'll, I'll never forget, I, I think, and Sally, I believe you were in this class with me, um, was, was a, a graduate seminar on Faulkner taught by Marilyn Robinson. And she closed her eyes and said, the ambitious use of language is always an epistemology. And it has kind of tattooed itself into me in some odd kind of way that, that and, and I hear it in Jen talking about using English to its fullest potency and, and hear it in this, this thread that, that um, Forrest is weaving through what everyone said. And, and there is this way where it's, it's you know, that, that one turns to these poems and the work of translation must deeply be tied to this not exactly to learn a knowledge, um, but to learn what it is to go about the architecture of learning and, and the ways in which that is an extraordinarily fragile thing. Um, and, and, you know, I like Pound is such, a, such an important example to bring up and oddly Sappho is who I'm translating now. And, you know, Pound had this, this this furious drive to make things cohere, even as the force to make them cohere is the very force that makes them fall apart and, and how it is to translate. So, so the strange stress of that fragility of, of the thing holding together just enough um, brings us into some, I think, um, human recognition that lasts the ages, I guess. Thank you. I am, I, I'm like trying to work the questions into this wonderful conversation and don't really want to redirect it. But you know, there's one that just came up that from um, Kate that says, do you worry about your own interventions or voice prints on the translations that you do? Um, so I, I think that that relates a little bit to, to, to what you've been talking about. But, um, and, and another question was, 
um, from Bill, does working with the language of translation bring you closer to being in some way? So I think these are both about trying to interact with, um, you know, the you know the originality and the essence of a poem that is not your own poem, really. I can uh, jump in and say, um, yeah, I do worry about it. Um, and before the project that I that I've read from tonight, I've always, well, almost always translated writers who were dead. I did translate a French a, a novel by a French novelist who's still alive. Um, but when you translate people who are dead, um, you really, you own the work in a different way. And um, Fitsovsky has, has passed away, but I had a co-translator who, as I mentioned, was a sort of protege, has been a, a protege Fitsovsky. And, you know, having an interlocutor is a powerful thing where you have to earn every, um, or, or at least you have to um, bicker or discuss every disagreement. Um, and of course there are going to be many, but it, it bears in mind to say, I mean, the, what that question provokes is that, is the reminder that, um, you know, translation is not, um, it's not pure writing of poetry. You know, you, you, there's always this issue of the law of the fidelity or the loyalty um, and, and how, how one evinces that loyalty, uh, that fidelity, is it through being literal or is it through making a work of art that stands as strongly in the, in the target language? But to sort of undermine all of what I just said, I actually, to go back to what Dan's last comment was, I wanna say the older I get, the longer I do all of, all of these ac various activities, I think they're all the same. I think reading, writing, um, editing, translating, I think that they're different modes of the same human activity that is, the, is, is very precious. Um, and there's, there's sort of, they're different manifestations or products, but they're, but they're all they're deeply interrelated, and and even writing you know a poem in English is a translation of of experience. So I, I mean I want to put that out there too. I mean translation is is so interesting because of of what it problematizes and how impossible it is to to pin any of these things down. Um, but I think that's okay. I think this is what we do when we're writers, or but we traffic in these. Um, these realms where we can never be the authority. You know, we can never, we're, we're not the scholar. We can't say the definitive thing. We can only suggest. Which makes me think, you know, that what, what those different things that you're talking about, Jennifer, are, are modes of, are they're modes of intimacy. And in intimacy, you don't become the other person's voice, but you learn that voice so deeply. Yeah. Yeah, Forrest, I thought that was just so beautiful the way you wrote about, you know, inhabiting that poem about Bracho's mother that, you, you know, and, and you became more comfortable, you know, with that poem than with your own poem. I thought that was really very moving. For sure. Uh, when I were, I when I worked on my translation, um, Ananda Devi, I didn't know her, but I did reach out to her eventually, and she did read the translation. She is perfectly bilingual. She speaks, she's fluent in English. And she had actually translated, she's mostly a novelist actually, um, and she had tra self-translated one of her early novels from French into English. She only writes in French, she doesn't write in English. And she translated that book and she just said she would never do it again because it was just torture for her. She said it was just like writing the book over again and it was so boring and she'd rather just write a new book, you know? So she doesn't translate her own work at all, but she had a very different attitude about it. Like I, you know, she did give comments and she did say, that is not precisely what I meant with some nuance or some, uh, I did, uh, you know, some particular imagery around some botanical that she was using and I was trying to draw some significance about it. And she said, no, that's not really, that's not where I was going, you know. But mostly she left it to me. 
Um, and she really, you know, she really supported, even when I was making, I, I think, I, mean, I don't know if you all agree, I actually think that French and English as languages are really far apart from each other in terms of diction and flow and what they sound like and the rhythms. It's, you know, I think it's just a completely, a complete transformation. You know, there's no way of imitating the sound. And so there were times where I felt so, I write about it in the essay that's up on Poetry Daily. There were times where I felt so bad about not being able to approximate the music of French. And I tried these different, you know, instead of trying in any way to copy it, I just decided to just go in a fully different direction. And she said, no, that was perfect what you did. So I think it, it matters their attitude. The per if you're working with a living writer who can read the language you're translating with, um, sometimes it will be more collaborative where they will do a lot more corrections. She happened to be, I think Mahmoud Darwish was like this too, where he would just say to his translators, like, don't bother me with that, you know, just do do what you're gonna do, you know. I, I loved how you talked about, you know, having to go like leaving France and, and, and ending up in India and 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 the way you describe like being next to the water and the kind of physicality of the way this other, you know, the, the way the language kind of entered you. And I thought that that's also so beautiful and parallel to the experience of like trying to access a poem, you know, in. in it was her landscape. It was, the, yeah. I mean, I was on the Arabian Sea in Kerala on cliffs. It was, it was the same landscape as Mauritius. And so somehow it just, yeah, it you know, something clicked in my brain, I think. Well, you know, I, I mean, I can't believe there's a pause and we're coming to, you know, three minutes to the end of the hour. So maybe I, I should just tell can me. I, speak. Can yeah. I make sure, Sally, is there time? I just want to make sure someone asked a really interesting question in the yeah. chat. Is translation performative? Oh, please. I haven't gotten down that, that far down the chat. Yes, please speak to it. I would love I, to. I, I don't want to speak to it. I'm curious if my co-presenters have something to say about that. I think that's a super interesting question. Mm. What do you think? What do I think? <laughs> yeah. I, th I think, yeah, I mean, it is, it is definitely a performance, but it's less, well, I, this is, I actually wrote this in the, in the introduction in my translator's note to the book. I said, it's less karaoke and more full, full, full blown drag. Like, I mean, for me, it was like becoming the other person, stepping inside their language, especially with Marguerite Duras, her language is so particular. It's like I would start speaking in those little choppy sentences because <laughs> I so just soaked in her sensibility, you know, it was actually really beautiful. But yeah, I do think it's a performance. I think you're actually, you, I think for me, it was like becoming another person. I, I mean, Dan, what do you think in ancient Greek? Well, you know, I'm not the most performative of people. <laughs> um, do you know, like one of the, like one of the words in ancient Greek that you know, feels so essential is myth, which in Greek is muthos. And what it means at its kind of primary etymology is just a, a, a word the moment it leaves the lips, you know, it's like this irrevocable moment of utterance in some way. And the way in English is accidentally sort of homophonic with, um, with muthos has, has made me think of the the, the myth and, and the mouth as, as sort of the same in, in some kind of way, which is simply to say that that is perform like, like all language is, is like performative in some absolutely phenomenological kind of way, I think. Um, and, and that you don't get to take it back. Like it's, it's there, it's, it's out of the mouth suddenly. Mm -hmm. But you know that, that notion, give me a mask and I'll tell you everything. Who's, who said that? Auden? Yates? Wild? <laughs> I think Wild said that. Um, I mean, transitions definitely perform. I agree with, I agree with both, with both. I also think that one form of performance, I mean, you're not writing your own work, right? You're, um, I mean, it's, I think it's performative the way that an actor might perform um, a text or the way a musician might play Chopin, you know, um, it is interpretation, performance is interpretation. I think that's what's really interesting. Good analogy. 
And um, George Steiner, you know, famously said that this, I love this, that um, translation is, is the most sophisticated act of reading possible. Mm -hmm. and, and that makes complete sense to me because you really have to take into account um, all sorts of things about the language and the tradition. And, and that's what informs one's interpretation and that's what informs one's performance. If, uh, there is, there's a book, I forget the author, but there is actually uh, a, a monograph, uh, I think called Translation as Performance that when I get home, I'm now gonna go back to and look up. Okay, well, you know what? Thank you all so much. I mean, that we could, I, I feel we could kind of um, talk for, for a really long time, but you know, these Zoom things have their limits, I guess. Um, but what a, what a pleasure to be in conversation with the four of you. Um, and thank you all so much, the audience for joining us tonight. Um, again, I really thank Dan, Kazim, Forrest and Jen. Um, I thank Martin for, you know, doing all the tech stuff. Um, I hope you'll join us next month on December 18th, again at 8 p.m. for Matvey Yankovic, Taji Silverman, Johannes Gorenson, and Rowan Ricardo Phillips. And we will do this once a month for the next, you know, three months. And their essays will also be appearing, you know, on Monday. So, so check in. Um, so thank you again. Be safe. Um, be well. We love you, Sally. <laughs> thank you. It was really and fun. Thank you, Matt. Yeah. We can see you all, but this was really great. Um, and yeah, thank you. It was really inspiring. I have a page full of notes. So be good. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye.